In this lecture we're going to discuss a metaphor about hypothesis testing and we're going to look at trials and jury verdicts to make these ideas that we've been talking about with hypothesis testing memorable. Let's run through and review really quickly some of these ideas. Remember the null hypothesis, I think about it as being a starting place where you are starting from a place of ignorance and the burden of proof is on you to show that the null hypothesis is not correct. Now many people in research will, will phrase it this way, that the null hypothesis should reflect the opposite of what you'd like to try to show and again the burden on you is to show that that opposite thing is not right. So for example, if you were doing research on welfare reform and you'd like to show that welfare reform has had an effect on people's lives, whether it's good or bad, then you start by assuming that it has had no effect. Then the burden of the proof, the burden of the data, the evidence is to show that that null hypothesis is wrong before you can stand up and say that you have found something interesting here. So a null hypothesis is something that's not interesting, just a state of ignorance. The, the most boring thing you can say sometimes is the way I think about it. Now remember a type 1 error, alpha, is the probability you will reject a true null hypothesis. 1 minus alpha we call the confidence level and that is how confident or how certain you should feel if you reject a null hypothesis how confident are you that you've done the right thing? A type 2 error, beta, is the probability you will fail to reject a false null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is false, but you don't detect it. Power is 1 minus beta. That's how good you are going to be, or how probable it will be, that if the null hypothesis is false, that your evidence, your data, will show that it is false. And a p-value, this is something that you calculate or estimate, and that's the probability that if the null hypothesis was true, what is the likelihood that you could have gotten data like this, or evidence this far away from that null hypothesis starting place? And so that p-value, you can think about as telling you some information about the likelihood that that null hypothesis is true. Now, not technically speaking, but that's a way to think about it. Now, there are two main ways to think about in a trial about burdens of proof or levels of evidence that are required to find guilt. In a civil trial, it's the preponderance of evidence. And a preponderance of evidence, most people would agree, is at least 50% that the defendant is in the wrong. Otherwise, you're going to vote for the defendant. And so instead of 51%, some people would say 50.1%, but why not say 50.00001%, right? But at least 50% that the defendant is in the wrong, otherwise the defendant wins. Now, in a criminal trial, it's not preponderance of the evidence, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And what does that mean? Well, here's a some instructions, these are kind of common instructions from a judge. This is from a particular case in 1989 where the judge instructed the jury if you entertain a reasonable doubt as to any fact or element that is necessary to constitute the defendant's guilt, it's your duty to give them the benefit of the doubt and return a verdict of not guilty. And so that's the basic idea. You can pause it and read the rest of this if you like. But what do people actually think about reasonable doubt? This is a survey done, and I don't remember the exact source where I got this, but this is a survey done of judges, jurors, and students about confidence level. How certain do you need to be about guilt before it goes beyond reasonable doubt? So reasonable doubt would be our alpha. What is the uh, probability that you're willing to take um, of convicting an innocent person, that's alpha. Um, so getting beyond that level of confidence, uh, how confident do you have to be before you're willing to vote to convict? Now some jurors and students said, oh, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent maybe 
Uh, if they're 40% chance they're guilty, I'll vote to convict. Uh, some people said exactly 50%. I'm willing to convict. Now, there are a lot of judges, 106 out of the 347, uh, who said that I don't think you should vote to convict someone unless you are absolutely, positively, 100% sure they're guilty. And I have a problem with that because there is always some small, minute possibility that someone's innocent. Even if you have a picture of the person, even if you have DNA, there's a small possibility that they could be innocent. And so 100% is too high of a level of burden of proof, I think. But of course, there are a lot of opinions about this. So thinking about what goes on in a trial, again, alpha, rejecting a true null hypothesis, beta, failing to reject a false null hypothesis, confidence is 1 minus alpha, power is 1 minus beta. In a jury trial, a criminal trial, you are supposed to assume that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. Now, we don't like the word prove, but at least prove beyond some reasonable doubt. So the null hypothesis is that the person's innocent, and it is the burden of the state to reject that null hypothesis, to convince a jury that there's enough evidence to reject that null hypothesis. And so what would a type 1 error be? Rejecting a true null Alpha is the probability you're willing to take in convicting an innocent person. Now, think about what probability that would be. A lot of times you're told, use an alpha of 5%. Take a 5% chance of convicting an innocent or rejecting a true null. Do you always want to use 5%? I don't think so. Uh, I think it depends on what the cost is of convicting an innocent person. Now, before I'm willing to send someone to death row, I'm not willing to take a 5% chance of killing an innocent person. Are you? And so I might choose an alpha of 0 .001. Uh, I don't want to take a high chance of convicting an innocent person if the cost of making a mistake is that an innocent person is killed. But what if it's a parking ticket, $20 parking ticket? Am I willing to say, yeah, I'm 80% sure that they parked there. There's a 20% chance that it wasn't them or it wasn't that car, but I don't care. I mean, uh, what's the cost of convicting this innocent person? They have to pay 20 bucks and they really shouldn't have paid 20 bucks. That to me is not a huge cost. So alpha can be high when the cost of making a type one error isn't that bad. Now, beta. That's the probability that you let the guilty go free. Now, if I have to be 99.999% sure before I'm willing to make someone pay a parking ticket, I think that's a little extreme. So I don't want, want to let a lot of people who uh, are murderers go free, certainly. But um, you know, convicting a few innocent parker, uh, illegal parkers I think isn't that bad. But, but think about what's the cost of letting the guilty go free. Well, you, you don't want to, while you want alpha to be low for a murderer, you, you don't want to convict an innocent person of murder. At the same time, you don't want to let murderers free on the street. Um, so suppose, but suppose for a particular prosecutor in a particular trial that their beta was 10%, that 10% of the guilty people don't get convicted then the power would be 90%. Power is the ability of a prosecutor to convict people who really are guilty. So they have a 90% success rate, not overall success rate, but a 90% success rate for those people that are guilty. So one last thing that we have to go through that's very important is what happens when you change alpha? Suppose you walked into a court and after the evidence had been presented, you say, I'm not willing to take a 5% chance of, of convicting an innocent person. I'm now only going to take a 1% chance of convicting an innocent person. That's good. But what are you doing? You're demanding more evidence before you're willing to reject the null hypothesis. And while it will mean that you'll convict fewer innocent people, when you demand more evidence before you're willing to vote guilty, 
it means you're also less willing to vote guilty for guilty people. And so when you push that alpha down, you're, also, you're going to be pushing your beta up. You're going to be less likely to actually convict the guilty. Now you can set alpha equal to zero and you'll never convict an innocent person, but you will also never convict a guilty person. Now, if you increase alpha, you're more willing to convict the innocent. You're going to be more likely to convict the guilty as well. And so how can you push, you know, how can you have the best of both possible worlds? The only way is to get more evidence. That way you can have a low alpha, low risk of convicting the innocent, but also be more likely to convict the guilty. So we demand more evidence in murder trials than we do for parking tickets. And lastly, the p-value would mean, what's the probability they could find this much evidence on an innocent person?